Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash Agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. Welcome to this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me tonight, we have a very large panel with kind of a a different type of topic. Tonight, we're going to tackle... The, the mystical world of conference submissions and the art of getting a talk potentially accepted. But joining me tonight to help me with this uh, fascinating topic, Tim Oninger. Tim, how are you? I'm doing great, Ryan. Hope things great you're yeah. out your way, too. It's great my way. Always uh, glad to have you join us. Don Gray, we have pulled him from his slumber, denied him his uh, much-needed rest, to bring him on to another episode of Agile for Humans. Don, thank you for joining us. Thank you for offering the opportunity to uh, join once again. Always welcome, Don. I'm Atai Schleier, my fellow Hoosier, joining us again from actually Indiana, aren't you? I would like to offer a strong disclaimer that I do not represent the state of Indiana in any way. I'm not from here. I just live here right now. But okay, it's cool. Yeah, and I am from home right now this week, which is a real nice change of pace. Which is unusual when you have a panel of consultants. I think I'm the only one that's not a consultant, but to have them all podcast from home, this is actually a pretty rare thing. But also joining us, who's also, I think he's at home in uh, St. Louis, uh, Jason Tice. Jason, how are you tonight? I'm doing well, Ryan, and I'm so excited we finally had a chance to uh, connect and uh, have a conversation about something related to Agile. I know that the conversation of you and I doing a podcast went back to Coach Camp in 2015, and so it's great to um, actually see this come to fruition. Yes, definitely excited to do this. We've been going back and forth, but tonight, Jason, I'm afraid you might be in the meat grinder. Oh, boy. Yeah, I think I'm in for it. Yeah, what we're doing tonight, this is a different kind of episode. I want to start out at the beginning saying uh, this is an independent podcast. We are in no way affiliated with the Agile Alliance. We do not speak for them. We do not represent them or any other conference that may be discussed. But tonight, with that said, we are going to talk about uh, submitting talks to conferences, uh, some of the selection processes that go on behind the scenes, some of the approaches and strategies that some of us uh, have taken to get accepted to conferences, especially or more specifically Agile ones, and, and also take a look at a recent submission by Jason that was accepted to Agile 2016, perhaps some ways that it could be improved, crafted, and and just worked on uh, to be uh, ready for uh, the big conference coming up here in July. I'm ready. Give, let's turn the meat grinder on. Are we ready? <laughs> the meat grinder is I on. will share that on this Agile Live, we actually talked about doing this uh, for a submission of one of our hosts, uh, Craig Buchek, who actually submitted a talk that uh, for Agile 2016 that was not selected. Um, I actually think Craig abandoned the submission during the process because I we were talking about it. So we deemed that talking about a conference submission on a podcast was the equivalent of making sausage. So... <laughs> Your meat, gr- your meat grinder and metaphor is very appropriate. Where we're going to start, so Jason submitted a really interesting proposal to the leadership track. And for full transparency, uh, Don, I believe you were the track chair for the leadership track. Am- Amitai and I were reviewers on that track, so we are very familiar with Jason's submission. And he came up with an interesting angle on how to do uh, performance review discussions. And so he did a he proposed a a talk called Improving Performance Review Discussions with Metaphorical Effectiveness Modeling. And it uh, caught everyone's attention, made it through the process, and was accepted and uh, really looked to be an interesting uh, type of type of talk. So Jason, we always start at the beginning of these. What gave you the idea? Where was the inspiration point? Because I think that kind of information 
could be helpful to listeners out there who are trying to get in uh, to the speaking world? Uh, so about the talk or about why to submit? I, w- I think both are good. Okay, so the activity is based upon, I guess, my experience uh, supporting Agile transformation and really uh, d- uh, software delivery activities and things that I see that ultimately, I'm going to say, hurt teams and hurt the people involved. And, you know, it's the classic model where you're trying to promote this idea of self-managing Agile teams. However, those teams are typically operating in an organization in some element of an organizational hierarchy where there's, you know, there's there are in inputs from that hierarchy that can challenge the autonomy of the self-managing team. The five of us pretend we're all on a team together, yet, Ryan, guess what? You're my employment manager, and you do my performance review at the end of the year, and you have an input in if I get a compensation adjustment or not. So, so you know, I find those conversations, Jason, to be basically, why don't you tell me how you performed, and then we'll sit down, and I'll tell you what the right answer really yeah, is. But, but uh, so again, so the, this is, again, something I, we thought about for Agile teams, because if that's occurring within the construct of an Agile team, Again, the self-managing team model is not going to work because you've kind of shot it in the foot. So I've actually done some work in prior years where we took uh, we took elements of Luke Holman's innovation games framework and we did an end-to-end process where you could gamify your performance review system. Actually, I know a few organizations that have adopted this. Uh, I've talked about it at a few conferences and open spaces. What this approach was was a way to say, you know, suppose you're a more traditional organization you have a HR mandated, you know, employee manager uh, review process. What's a way that we could sit down and enable people to have a more effective communication? Uh, so if you pause right there, I think that's the great opening line for your abstract. I think you just nailed the first right line for your abstract. And here's why. Here's what in your description of of the the proposed talk, here's what you've done. And I, and I want to get the other uh, guys in on this. You explained your own experience. You, you, you based your talk on your own experience. You addressed a need, a pain point. These reviews were being painful. And what you did was you brought an innovative solution to the table. And I think those are three key important elements. And that last statement you just made, I think, brought all that together. Now, guys, when you're coming up with talks, I, I know the, the rest of us here put proposals together. Do you find that those three activities, you know, the addressing your own experiences covering a pain point, and then trying to find an innovative angle. Are those at the core of the talks that you do as well? I got a whole game for that. It's called the pain game. And it's a, it's a brainstorming game where you talk about pain, and then you root cause it, and then you action plan it. So uh, I, I'm going to plus one that, because that's, I know, the, one of the techniques I used to come up with ideas, but I'd love to hear what the others say. I tend to agree. I don't think I have any special expertise, either as a reviewer or as a submitter. But uh, what has appealed to me when I've looked for talks to attend at conferences is typically what is this person's angle on something that matters to me? And sometimes the angle itself can make it matter to me. Uh, It could be a problem that I didn't know I have or I don't currently have, but something about this sounds like it's going to be an interesting story. Uh, So whether or not it's, uh, you know, a story arc with a beginning, a middle and an end and a uh, protagonist and antagonists or whatever, uh, if it feels kind of like a story where there was some kind of a challenge and the person rose to meet it, or they had some some way of going around it so that it wasn't a challenge anymore. Uh, even if that's not a problem for me at the time, it becomes interesting. And so I've tried to model my talks uh, to an extent on that shape. So when I'm reviewing, as I have in the past, I usually come down to the question, which I think is the only important question, is does this serve the audience? If if I'm coming to this conference, either as a first timer or as a learning agilist or as an expert, would I pay this money to come hear this person give this story? And sometimes that means, you know, maybe I might have a bias towards a more celebrity speaker instead of an unknown. And I think that's fair because I'm, I'm only interested in serving the conference attendees. So if it's a unique story or if a person is uniquely qualified to express um, a a particular viewpoint, um, if it's somebody that people will line up to get into the room, I'm going to tend to give that a thumbs up. And so when I go as myself, then as I write a story, I'm trying to think, if I walked into this and, and I saw these other people here giving these other talks, what can I give that would be interesting and different from what they're doing? 
that's still authentic. And I think solving your own problem is, is a piece of authenticity that's important. But frankly, you know, if it's going to be a choice between me, um, Bob Martin, Martin Fowler, um, pick, pick your celebrity guy, those guys are probably going to get first shot. People are going to be more interested in hearing them. Can I ask why? Like, because I think there's um, there's interest, and I maybe go around the panel. Because as attendees, do you attend by name or do you attend by actually what's in the abstract? So, if anything, think about picking your sessions by not even looking at who's presenting, but looking at what's in their abstract and making a decision based upon the content, not being aware of who's sharing it. Yes. So you do? Do you do the latter? That was a computer science, yes. Uh, yeah, if it's a speaker that I've heard of before, then I'm, I am I almost don't care what they're talking about. If I loved hearing them last time, I'll probably prefer them this time. Uh, and then in the absence of a tiebreaker like that, of course, it's totally about what does that abstract look like to me. And for me, it's... So I agree with Tim about uh, different layers of celebrities. And I'm interested more in experience when i'm looking at a session we have this con you know, there there's theory and there's experience and reality and there's a saying that goes something to the effect of in theory there's no different be, difference between theory and reality in reality there is and so sessions which have experience in them speak to me more than theory sessions uh, so, uh, one of the things that I look for when I review sessions, and I think this is sort of in line with where we're going for the evening, is, is this a theory session? Theory sessions can be wonderful because that's how we form a base, a praxis, how we are going to approach reality in the future, or, or test our reality and our theory right now. But experience i'm more interested in experience than i am in theory because people can relate to experience uh a format that i've learned i learned many years ago back when CompuServe ruled the internet uh which is the hey you see so format which is hey there's this problem george is having this problem you have this problem too see here's how it can ties in and so here's how you can help solve it and it's sort of an arc that allows you to go through an abstract to go through a session to write an article that's actually where i learned it was writing articles you know the, the abstract for a session would be much shorter but it it you you have to connect quickly and experience is how you connect with other people in support of that, I would rather hear someone give a boring but personal experience report, you know, tied to things that actually happened, even if they don't do a great job highlighting the themes or telling the story in a perfect order. I'd rather hear that, that kind of experience, than even kind of a well put together theory. That's just my bias. I'd rather hear something that actually happened, that actually, uh, something that somebody went through and the experience that they had. And well, hopefully turned out well, but maybe not. I would go listen to Linda Rising read the dictionary. She is just such a delight, and she's such a wonderful person. And I did go to see her, even though I've seen her before, and she spoke on mindset. And when she spoke on mindset, I've read the book. I know that material, too. But the way that she brought it out and the way she put her heart into it made it much more important. And it has stuck with me more as the Linda Rising talk than as the Audible book. Um, and it helped me to apply it. But I'm, I'm not the average person going, maybe. I'm okay with that. Um, I've had to make rules for myself. I have to go see one person because I love them. I have to go support a friend's talk just because he's a friend. And I have to go see somebody I've never heard of on a topic I don't know I'm interested in. Those are three things I always set for myself. So. All right. Uh, all right. You, you need to say those three things one more time. That's, that's very useful. Okay. So, number one, go see somebody just because you love them. You appreciate that. And by the way, um, Lisa Adkins had a great one. She's so masterful, so wonderful. Um, you go to want to support a friend who's presenting. 
moral support. And then the other one is somebody you've never heard of talking about a topic you don't know you're interested in. That last one jumps out at me because yeah. in my conference going experience, I found that the most value for me as an attendee is to be had in uh, not going to a talk that I know a little bit about because I'm not going to get a lot in an hour, but going to something that I know nothing about and may never hear about any other way. Go to that one. Yeah, one thing I'll share about that actually is we um we did a neat experiment at Lean Coffee at Agile 2015 where uh, myself and a few others we kind of shared that that idea of hey you're at the conference today if you want to do something cool go to a session that you about something that you've absolutely never heard of or no don't know anything about and then come back to Lean Coffee the next morning and tell us about it and we had like it was like six or seven people that actually did that and it was like it was like fascinating. Because um, you had like, you know, non-technical scrum masters who, you know, went to go watch people refactor code and do test-driven development, something that they were not, they had heard of, but they really didn't know how to do it. And then they kind of came back and you could tell they learned a lot. So it's, if you're at a conference, you should definitely leverage it as an opportunity to expand your horizons and think about, you know, that idea of a T-shaped person. And maybe again, you're not going to become an expert in a one hour conference session, but you're going to make the top of your T a little bit wider, perhaps. Have you ever gone to see someone speak just because you'd read their book? Oh, this is like conference confessions. No. I'd have to say no. Hmm. See, I, I, I have a weird, because I, I put this way. However, however, let me say this. I have gone and bought the book after I heard them speak. Yeah, I assume the reverse must be true, but I can't think of any instances. For myself. Tice, what were you going to say? say is, like, I've, I've been planning to go to a con- like I planned to go to a conference. I had like signed up in advance before they had fully announced the program. Then they announced the program, and it was um, it was right when uh, Management 3.0 came out, and this was the Agile Games Conference a couple years ago when they had uh, Jurgen Apello keynote. And I was like, oh, that's cool, man. He's going to be there because that book is certainly interesting if you haven't read it. Um, it's got lots of ideas in it, and Jurgen's got lots of ideas. He's a great guy himself, and so it was it was neat to. I felt some element of, of, um, of some element of an emotional response when I knew that I was going to see him at the conference. I did not use that as a decision to attend. I just was pleasantly surprised when he was on the program. That's an interesting thing because if you go, you'll see that like when Uncle Bob speaks, the room is packed and it's standing room only, and it's two layers of people standing around the corners, you know. And if you go see, um, sometimes the Josh Karievsky keynotes carry a lot of people. You know, yeah. there's there there are topics. Um, I always love to see, you know, Esther with a big crowd or Diana Larson with a huge crowd. Um, and I think that that matters. I think the names carry do carry people in. So I, I think that there is a certain bias that makes sense. Um, the question kind of thrown out there is, how much is this about being fair? How much is it about being new? And how much is it about giving people what they want for their conference dollar? Though, Let me do the counter there because I think that's a common criticism of especially large conferences after they do their selections, people get angry that, but I would argue that those that we love to hear, like the Esther Derby and Diana Larson and the Don Grays of the world, yes, Don, you're one of those people. It's because they have great ideas and it's because they bring forward innovative thought to the industry. It's They've earned the bias, in my opinion. And so those criticisms, I, sometimes it's true. Sometimes the celebrity gets a pass and they do a, a faulty submission, but we all know it'll be great, so it moves on. That happens. And I think we have to be clear about that. For the many conferences that we've all been involved in, that happens. But for the most part, the, the Esther Derbys, the Diana Larsons, the, the Lou Cohems, the um, Jurgen Apellos, they've earned some of that celebrity because the thoughts resonate, they're compelling, and they're innovative. Right. I think that's fair. And that's, and the guidance, you know, that I want to throw out there for people um, and I'll share from I'll share a real a real life example of this is if you're listening to this podcast and, you know, you're saying, well, how do, how do I start to to get into to, to get to where myself as a submitter or yourself as a submitter may have some of that that bias? There is a certain element like we're saying here about how you structure a submission and the one of the best ways to really learn about that isn't just to keep submitting, but kind of like myself, like Ryan. So I think everyone on the podcast has done volunteered to help put together a program for a conference in some capacity. 
Because what you will see if you do this is, you know, you'll kind of, you will immediately see, wow, some people put their ideas together this way, and this is how they they tell their story. And this also is, wow, this is a really new idea. This is something that I have no idea. So it's it's like an experiment. Maybe we should try it. And if you see that as a reviewer or kind of as a coach, because some conferences call it a submission coach, it inevitably helps you learn. I know of at least two instances uh, uh, for the learning track for Agile 2016, where we had reviewers who volunteered first time ever they had re- volunteered to review. They helped us coach submissions for the conference. And actually, two of them now that I know of have had talks accepted at other conferences. So things that they learned by helping us run the call for programs has enabled them to, again, learn how to go through this process and ultimately put together better content for review and selection elsewhere. I think that's important. Uh, they, and, and understanding, you know, why do people choose who they choose? And sometimes, frankly, you know, I have seven submissions. The talks, when you look at the titles, they're almost the same. When you look at the abstracts, they're almost the same. It's an important topic, but I've got a handful of these. Now, how am I going to pick between them? Well, one of them is, you know, it, it, I have a concert venue. We have a big price. One of the bands that might come is U2. The other one is local Chicago band Drifting in Silence. <laughs> Which one are you going to pick? Yeah. I think it's fair that when somebody establishes some reputation for speaking and, and for some topic, that they give a, a little bit of boost. On the other hand, you know, what if only two people had anything to say about um, how they've used Docker to make themselves uh, more agile as a management team. <laughs> I'm thinking that's 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 clear water. That's not red water. That's blue water. You know, we're going to want to sail into that blue water. That's not where all the rest of the sharks are feeding. Yeah, that's something new. But but Tim, you're hitting on one thing there that I think is something that a lot of people should think about is that. There is a certain element to understanding the goals of a conference that you may be submitting to, because some conferences are technically, you know, some conferences straight up are for profit. You know, they're being run as a business operation where, you know, someone is supposed by the speakers may be compensated in some form. Uh, The organizers may be, you know, they may be using that for some type of a revenue stream. Some conferences are done as a not for profit, but they're done as a fundraiser. You know, so at that point, there's the desire to, again, you're building a program that you actually want to sell because you want people there because you're ideally offsetting other expenses. The, uh, the large Agile Alliance conference is an example of that because they use that to earn revenue, which then they use to fund many of the other great programs that the Agile Alliance supports as a not-for-profit organization. And then, of course, there's other conferences that are maybe more um, – actually, the, the one I want to just talk about is the Conference for a Cause Model, which I think the guys in D.C. do better than anyone I know out there where they say, hey, we're having a conference. We're actually going to raise money, but then we're going to give it away all to charity, which is – phenomenal if you if you attend that or you support that it just feels good and and then of course there's other basically just you know break even or even like no cost conferences unconferences so that in that should that should influence you how you submit because that's there's a part of the bias that comes into that equation because at the end of the day it does impact are we trying to sell something here or not I think that's it's part of the the baseline when you go to submit to a conference. So you look at if they provide guidelines, read the guidelines. If they offer a help system, utilize the help system and the coaching that they provide. If they if they offer, uh, I'm getting a thumbs up from Don. Uh, if they offer um, example submissions that have been successful in the past, in the past, take those to heart. If they give you the ability to look at the current roster and the roster of selected talks from all previous years, take a look and see what's trending and then get away from that and find a unique angle. I mean, there's all these different ways that you can approach submitting that, that is outside of your actual submission. You know, talk to your friends, send out your, send out your proposal to, to five people like the, the five of us talking right now, uh, and see, you know, I've, I've asked Tim and Amitai and Don and, uh, in the past, hey, does this sound like a neat idea? And can we talk about it on the podcast and workshop it a bit? And lo and behold, it turns into a talk. And I'm sure Jason does that with his peer group as well, and it, and it, and it works great. But there's all these things you can do to just try to position your ideas that much more ahead 
j- just from the start. And that's, I mean, there's an element of risk taking on both the part of the submitter and the conference. And mm-hmm. for the submitter, if you put in one talk, then it's all or nothing for you. Uh, but for the conference, you're one of many. And they, you may be the talk they take a little bit of a risk on, or you may not be a talk they take a little bit of a risk on. Uh, and so one of the things you can do is try to figure out where that knife edge is. Like what's, what's in the sweet spot for this conference and what's just far enough away from it that what I say might be usefully varying from what they usually get, but not too far so that it's, you know, it's off on a limb somewhere. And then the flip side is as a submitter, you can also hedge your own risk if you really want to be there speaking. You can put in, you know, in, in a lot of systems, you can put in six, ten submissions. Of course, you have to make them good enough that one of them gets selected or else it's just ten zeros. But there's what I'm trying to say is that there's risk strategy on both sides. And the the uh, incentives may not be exactly the same. And it's important as, as a submitter to remember what chances is this conference willing to take with me. So I think that's an important point. And Don, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're... Um there were around 1,200 submissions to the big conference, to Agile 2016. And I believe they accepted about one in five. And so I I don't think it's that good. Uh, On our, on our track, one in seven made it. And we had 24 slots. I think I heard one of the tracks, I think was uh, culture coaching and teamwork had like 400 submissions right for approximately the same number of slots so you know it it varies by conference by track but there were like I don't know you maybe one in six may be correct because one in five one in six because if there were 1200 submissions I think there's around 200 sessions right yeah so it even from the start, there's a, a large number of submissions to larger conferences. You've basically got a one in five, one in six chance, and that's just all else being equal. Uh, any subpar uh, submission is going to be in trouble. Some of the outside things that we've talked about, like looking at past rosters help, but it's the odds are it's, it's, it's uphill from the beginning. And so that, I think that's an important point to remember, too, is that uh, it's, it's a percentage game in some respects that sometimes can be hard to win. I think it's maybe worth noticing. Um, so far, every, as every time I've been in, there certainly is some bias for reputation, but it's not um, a bias for my friends. So even if I'm a, heading a track, you're not going to get into the track just because you're my buddy. You're going to go through the same process, every, process everybody else is. And if you're giving the same talk as somebody else who's done, doing a great job of it in the past, um, you're still probably not going to make it because being my friend's not enough. Maybe I'm not important enough. Uh, but I've not seen that be the bias that makes a determination. I've seen it only be, you know, maybe you can get extra coaching from me. I would be happy to do that for you, but you're going to go through the same process as everybody else. Yeah, so we actually have two sessions on our track that are from reviewers. And I don't know how I don't know if Ryan's gotten over what I said to him yet, but he let me on the podcast, so I'm guessing he has. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, dude, really? But it's I think you're correct, Tim. It's that okay. I'm going to coach you, and I'm going to be a little bit more, a little bit less nice because this is you know what we're looking for, and. Mm-hmm. Um, the content was fine. It was his abstract that I took umbrage with. Yeah, Don was... Um, and, and so what Don's alluding to is I did end up getting a, a talk accepted on the leadership track. And, and what I found was that my friends were my, my harshest critics, but I love them for it. You know, Don, uh, the thing I can count on from Don is that he'll always shoot straight and right at the head. And so, <laughs> <laughs> it's always a headshot with him, but it's always a good one. And... Uh, you know, I, I think the talk ended up better because of that, the, the, the critical view that my friends on that track gave it. And, and keep in mind, too, I'm one in six submitting to the, to the, to the big comp. So this is the first time I, I have found success at it. I was a reviewer last year and got bounced out four out of four. And so it, I think you're right, Tim. It, it, well, a friend- and you had another talk on the track that did not get accepted. 
Correct. So and it's not like, oh, you're a reviewer for the track, you're automatically in. I think that's important to note, too. That I think that's a, a criticism that will come out sometimes over social media from people. And that, um, in fact, I, I personally believe, having gone through this now, that uh, if you are a reviewer on a track, you are going to get some heavier criticism in some circumstances mm-hmm. than other talks. And I think that's fair and appropriate. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, Don, I love the headshots, and then, like I said, I think it made I think it made the talk better. Also, by the way, if you happen to know a reviewer, be kind. You know, it's one of those things. Don't ask him to throw the other reviewers under the bus. Hey, you voted for mine, didn't you? Who voted against mine? Can you tell me? Yeah, you know, that's, so, don't don't do that. Don't do we, that we, because we it's have, hard. We, we deal with that by going. The correct people to ask is the program committee. You ask the program committee for advice and information. Do not ask the tracks. If your session did not get accepted, at least for Agile Alliance, the correct response is, please talk to the program committee. They have the information to help you understand. Mm-hmm. And, and what I've found, too, even other conferences. So, guys, we're all familiar with Agile Indy. We're familiar with Path to Agility. We're familiar with uh, the SQE series, all great conferences with, with really good organization. If you just reach out and ask, they're typically very open about uh, why it didn't make it. And often, <laughs> and, and often, you know, it, it gets back to situations that we've talked about before that, you know, there were four other talks about Kinefin this year, and uh, we picked one with the bigger name. And, but your talk looked good, too. Or there were all these different things going, or perhaps your submission sucked. And that happens too. I think there are certain submissions that that don't follow the guidelines, they don't utilize the help system, and they suffer for that. And I think that's got to be a, a fair statement as well. So let me offer um, a way to achieve an unfair advantage. Ooh. So those who well, are looking for the unfair advantage, this this is where you go. Number one, take advantage of the early submission and all the shepherding. Yes. You've really got to do that especially if you're early on. Number two, if you know people who have spoken in the past at this conference or another one, get them to shepherd you before you even send in your submission. When I started landing these things fairly consistently was when I started going with um, Ashley Johnson or um, Bill Wake or I have colleagues, you know, they speak at conferences and we'll share and we'll even work on them together. Um, um, Brian Beecham, for example. And so we'll co-author the submissions so that we have two sets of eyes, just like when you're writing code and you pair program or mob program to get it right. And then you send that in and then you take advantage of the further coaching. Because sometimes, you know, the, the person who's coaching you on the committee is saying, you know what, you're, this is really a lot like another talk, but I can't tell you that. Instead, I'll say, you know, this would be better if it were to go in this slightly different direction. Hint, hint, hint. Because otherwise you're going to give the same talk as Esther and we're going to have to drop you. I can't say that, but I can hint that when I'm on, on the committee. And I can't speak to other conferences, but the submission help and instructions that the track chairs and track reviewers get changes slightly from year to year with the Agile Alliance. So what you su- if you haven't submitted in the last three or four years, things have changed. And so Tim's suggestion of peer reviewing or peer submitting and then following the submitting early and asking for help if it's being offered are critical. Because early on, reviewers have time to help. When it comes down to the, we're locking down submissions and you can't submit after this date, we get a rush and there were some, I thought I read every session that was submitted to my track, did not. I found a colleague of mine submitted a session and I didn't realize it until we were doing the final review. Uh, it, and it's not that it would have made any difference because I didn't review his sessions. And if I had, I would have had to recuse myself because he's a colleague. But it's like, wow, I didn't even know he put a session on the leadership track. 
Yeah, I, I think that's another quick important point too, that there are conflict of interest rules that go along with many of these conferences now. And a lot of those uh, conflict of interest rules are, are buried into code of conducts. And so I, I think a lot of that stuff is very heavily watched now. And I know that uh, it, it's really an integrity point that a lot of conferences now pride themselves on. And even back to Don's point of reading, I think roughly the, the 200 or, or so submissions to the track that we were on, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's a volunteer effort, right? So we're all volunteers uh, who love Agile, who want to help put together a great conference, and who are reading submission after submission after submission. Um, and so like Tim said, be kind. But at the same time, I think everyone on that track is open to questions during the process if, if, only, if only they were asked. Right. We're looking for evidence of, uh, is this talk by this person at this conference in conjunction with the other talks that we were looking at, uh, something that we feel like is a good bet or, or a risk worth taking. And one of the things you can do to give us evidence is to be Bob Martin. Another thing you can do is to give us a really convincing spiel. And another thing you can do is be open to adapting when we offer you advice. So what Jason Tice did to get back to the actual topic, right? So I think we gave... We gave a lot of really interesting inside baseball to the world of conferences, submissions, and reviewing. Hey, hey Ryan, before you go, I got one more thing that I think we should just mention because it, it's related to this, but it is a different pivot. And yeah. that is that understand that nearly all conferences these days, not all, but nearly all, we'll talk about this in a moment, there is an option if you really want to share your content to just show up. Obviously, you've got to be able to get in the door. So if you're if you're submitting because you want sponsorship or, you know, you need sponsorship to attend, that's one thing. But like, you know, most conferences like the Agile, the large Agile conference, they have an area called Open Jam, which they run as an open space throughout the conference. If you are there in the building, you can go over there at any time and say, hey, at two o'clock, I'm going to talk about this. And they are always looking for more stuff. So again, it, there is an economic factor because you got to get there somehow. So, uh, but I don't know of a conference out there that doesn't have a, a venue for that these days. Especially with uh, the open spaces that are popping up at many of the conferences, that's or lightning talks. And, and I think that's one one last good point before we jump right back to uh, Jason's submission is that um, get experience. So there's no for for me. So I my own personal story. I wanted to get into speaking and so I decided to do it. My first one was at a local, uh, at the administrative office of one of the school corporations. They wanted to know about Agile. It was a group of 10 people. I went and gave a talk to 10 people. And I'll take those little gigs every day of the week uh, because it crafts your, your, your talk into something better each time. The feedback loops. We love feedback loops as Agilists, but as speakers, sometimes we don't. I'll take every talk I can get, small or large, to get better feedback, to, to craft a better talk, and to add speaking engagements to the list when I, re when I submit to a conference. So I'm not a new speaker when, when I submit to a conference. I have four or five talks I've given. I've got a few tweets that people have sent that have been very positive about the talk that I gave. And, uh, and I can actually present that. But the point is, get that experience. Give a lightning talk. Do an open space. Get feedback on that and keep rolling that rock forward. And eventually you get into these other venues. Yeah, does anyone here run, does anyone here run a user group? I do. So, and if you, run a user, if you run a local user group, you're always looking for content. So um, I'd almost like to say for everyone out there, and, and I see we're having a chat here in the chat here about, about – um, past presentations, like Ryan said, again, it would behoove you as a submitter to a formal conference to have at least some documented speaking experience. And my statement is there is no barrier to doing that because there are lots of user groups out there who are looking for content and will give you a platform to share. So with that said, Jason is, is clearly an experienced speaker, very articulate, uh, fellow podcast host, uh, user group leader. And he did have, like we mentioned at the very beginning, before we went down the, the inside baseball track, a very compelling uh, talk accepted into the leadership track. And so he did improving performance review discussions with metaphorical effectiveness modeling, and he provided really some excellent information to the program team in the appropriate section, which really sold the talk. And so as we went back to review, uh, 
clearly when when a conference is and a track is putting together abstracts and learning objectives those are the the two key things i think as amatai zeroed in on that uh, that people will focus on in lieu of celebrity and and other biases to read and to understand if they want to go to the talk now what jason has done he's put a lot of information into his abstract and so jason is his writing style writes heavy abstracts so jason's actually he's one of my favorite people i've only met him too in person many words. Once. but every time i meet him he is jason's a ball of energy and he he has, I wish I could bottle it and keep it because I want to be this alert, but I'm not. But Jason, he, he, he talks, uh, he's very articulate, he speaks a mile a minute, his ideas flow constantly. His abstract is a representation of Jason, of his own personality. <laughs> I love it, right? And so, and so he, um, he has put together an abstract that explains everything down to a, a level of detail that, I, that perhaps could be pared down. And I think that was the impetus for a discussion on coaching on it, but also making sure that once we pare it down, that the learning outcomes are still tied together correctly so that people know the intent of the talk and, and what they could take away from it. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I agree totally. And actually, the, I really like the one thing we mentioned earlier, which is the hey, you, see, do loop. I think that's a great way we could uh, refactor this abstract, which, again, is written it's written more like I'll show like a legal abstract. And the um, if anything, when I think about hey, you, see, do, to me, it looks like a job story. So it's almost like this idea of saying, you know, what is the context here? So there's some work to do here. And I think that uh, – yeah, that's just the post. That's something that I, that I know I need to get better at, uh, since uh, from some prior work that I've done in other fields, I do, uh, you know, I tend to write more if I write legalese, basically. So, Don, what do you think as far as abstracts in general? I know this one is, it's it's typically longer than some of the ones who we look at. But the as aside from the the model you provided, what are you looking for, and what advice would you give Jason on this particular abstract, if you don't mind being put on the spot? in order to get it ready for the, the conference? As I look at the abstract, I wouldn't attend this session. I wouldn't even give it a second thought. It's, it's, it's a run-on. It's, it's run-on. There's no segregation of thought. It starts with passive voice. I have no way to parse the information. I'll go find something that's more interesting, easier to read. I agree totally. Well, and the, th the key thing I'll share again from a viewpoint perspective is people that people, and this is good for people to realize is that typically these days at a conference, people are looking at the program synopsis on their mobile device using an app like Sketch, and they pop in there and really you, there, I'd say there is a length limit to your abstract uh, of probably about 200 words or maybe even about a hundred words, because that's all people can see on this, on a small pane of glass on their mobile. This abstract is written as legalese right now, and people where people at a conference do not make decisions, as you're saying, based upon a legal deposition. Also, I think that there is a matter of time. A lot of people are picking what they're going to watch and to look at um, over breakfast while people are trying to talk to them. So they're skimming. So you really need to pick up in the first sentence or two, what the heck is this? And if the title and the first sentence or two don't really hang, you know, grab you and somebody else's does, you know, it's like when people listen to music, give it less than 15 seconds usually before they decide this is a song I'll listen to. Yeah. So, so Jason, you mentioned that your talk is really the, the gamification of performance reviews, correct? Pretty much. Is that, is that a fair synopsis? Yeah. That, or a, that's a fair statement? It, it depends on your definition of gamification, but for all, in per, all intents and purposes, Ryan, yes. So what if you start even with the title and you say improving performance review discussions with gamification? I'm interested in that. I'm, I'm bothered by that. Okay. Only because, so, so gamification, I think we're overloading the term. Yeah. When I think of gaming, I think of gaming the system, gaming metrics, and that's to me is, an, is a, not a good thing. Uh, sure. I, I don't think Jason is using gamification in that way, so uh, I, I'm I'm nervous about using that word because yeah, suddenly I, he's going to have a thousand people show up to learn how to game their performance reviews, <laughs> and he won't have the, he will not have the audience he's looking for. Well, I, the, ab I, the abstract should do two things. And I learned this from Jerry Weinberg. One, it should pull in the people you want. And two, it should not pull in the people you don't want. 
Write that one down. That's a good one. Don, would you say that again? The abstract should do two things. It should pull in the people you want into the session, and it should not pull in the people you don't want. I love Weinberg. It's, you know, for those of us who have a chance, who have, you know, I was, like I said, I've always, I've always been lucky. I got a chance to work with him for 15 years as a business partner, and you just learn so much. But that's not the point of tonight's conversation. So were you even at all awesome before you started working with him? Because you, you are now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was awesome, but in a different dimension. There you go. So so we'll leave the title alone when we get to the abstract. So, Jason, what do you think? Well, so back to one more Weinberg. Write the abstract and the title will appear. So we're looking at this abstract, at least I am. And I'm wondering, uh, just in terms of percentage of how many words are currently here should be here when we're done what percentage are we thinking as a group so far i've made it to the second sentence because you're reading it as we're talking just like you were saying just so um sometimes i skip to the do the first and last sentences just to save time so one thing just in a in a linguistic analysis that my brain start, does first uh i see a lot of nouns and i see a lot of uh pieces of sentences like prepositional phrases before I can get to the end of a sentence. So I feel like a little a little Hemingway influence would do this a lot of good. How can we say less? Can, how can we maximize the words not done in these sentences? That's cool. The words not the words not said. Now before we go on too far, I do like that it started with a question. That was the first filtering criteria. You know, so, do you dread performance reviews? Bingo. Now, I think that's a universal bingo. true. That, that's it right there. Do you dread performance reviews? Now, from there, the question is, is this a way to avoid them, to eliminate them, or is this just a way to do them differently? Or a way to manage your dread? Well, the intent is is to improve them. So the hypothesis I'm making about the the, the people who would be attending is that they – they do not like them and they also believe that they could be improved and they would be interested in learning about that. Yeah, so these are are people who, who are in agile organizations or normal organizations who are still under a an individual performance review model who would seek better. Yeah. Now, better for which side? Now we get to that part cuz uh, oh, is that's this a, a great... Pareto improvement where it's better for one person and no worse for everybody else? Is this better for everybody? I need the, so I need kind of, there's a question, and then, you know, you can't eliminate them in your situation. Okay, that's, that's the next bit of context. I know if I'm in or out with that. Um, and then the next piece is, who can we make it better for? Well, it's funny. This is the Agile for Humans podcast. I would actually say it's humans. Right, but you're on the leadership track. Yeah. And so I think that, that you're seeking to make performance discussions better you're, you're enabling leaders to make performance discussions better for those that they serve on a leadership track at an Agile conference. That's correct. And or I'd say it's a way that anyone who happens to attend or is just interested, maybe they are not currently a leader. They could learn something and provide it as a suggestion as part of, say, coaching up the leadership chain in their organization. Does it make sense? Great point. Yep. So and, where, where I've run out of patience reading is I'm not sure what kind of better we're talking about. I yeah, I'm, I'm I can that. understand it, Tim. Okay. Here's what I want to say. I want to say where you feel more, more. Um, let me. Maybe we should talk a little about the technique because we're t- we're focusing, I think, a lot on the words. And you know, I don't know if we're fully understood on what the technique is. Uh, the technique here is really to eliminate communication bias, and it's actually based upon. Um, I got some funny videos we may show in the session that were actually filmed in real life feedback sessions where we used behavioral cueing to actually see that people were not that people were communicating with language and they actually didn't understand what they were saying to each other because they were they were using very specific language. So the idea here is to say, let's not have, let's just not start talking. And of course, it's a podcast, so we can be hypocritical about this because that's all we're doing here. Let's actually (laughs) sit down and say, I want you to think about something you're really good at. And then I want you to model it for me. And so you're going to model it and actually build a little, a little thing, a structure. And then I want you to tell me about it. And by going through that process, it creates a platform that the people involved, employee and manager, or even employee and employee, if you're doing a peer-to-peer review, they can start to have a conversation that's more focused on 
learning. So so that's kind of the, the gist here, I think, is really when we say better, I want to say it, it enables better feedback and a more learning-focused discussion because the improvement that we're, we're trying to break through is the elimination of communication bias. So that's your third sentence for the abstract. Yeah, I yeah, got let that. Me moot uh maybe an in-between for that so i love the opening question it draws me in it makes me think this might be for me let me read more uh and i like very much the as the third sentence what am i going to get i'm going to get better feedback and somewhere in between i'm thinking uh like you were starting to explain what would be an example of doing this because i see a lot in this abstract of the significance of of the problem and the significance of this approach to solving it and it's, there's a lot of significance, which is cool, but this isn't like an academic paper. We don't have to persuade the publisher to put this in their, in, in their uh, publication. We're trying to persuade, you know, me or, or somebody like me to, uh, you know, just make a, a snap judgment that says this includes me and this motivates me and I want to be there. And so I think for me, what I would like, and I'm, I'm trying to take myself as an average person, I may also not be, like Tim was saying, but I think what I would like to see in between the question and between uh, the sort of the, the payoff, the feedback, is just a tiny bit. What does this look like? Yeah. Yeah, and, and if you look at the current draft, the whole – I will answer my question about target length. My target length is, I'd say, about a quarter of the words that we currently have. Um, and that's based upon some other things that I've seen, actually. For, we're, we're doing the same process, reviewing abstracts on the learning track currently. And that's what there's a that's the pattern we're going for over there. But, like, there's a whole part, again, I don't know what I was thinking when we put this in there, where literally the mechanics of the exercise that we're going to use to demonstrate this in the workshop is explained in the abstract. We don't need to go into that level of detail, so we're going to take that out. So, um, so, so we'll get there. So here's what I like. So you got your question at front. I'm back into the words again. Sorry. That's yeah, okay. your question up front. Um, the whole second sentence I could throw out, except for the last like three or four words, where it says people call this fun. I think that's important. We need that, and the rest of that could probably go away. And then the next one says. So the third sentence should probably be the the second one. It says yeah. traditional performance review problems have problems because of one way feedback, which is not feedback, um, communication bias, confirmation bias, and this is through dialogue, and then it's fun, and then you could talk a little bit about the technique. But if you could give me like what is the outcome? So here's here's the topic, here's the problem, here's the outcome, and now it's down to well, how are we going to do that? Now, now you've got me kind of, you got me, you know, I've nibbled the hook to set the hook. You'll tell me what we're actually doing. Yeah. Yeah. And if anything, the, if you look at how this was written and I'll, unfortunately I've learned how my brain works, the, um, <laughs> the whole part where it says in this workshop. So like, I guess that's the start of the third sentence is almost from that point down is not relevant for an abstract that is intended to you know, set expectations to get the people in the room. So in my working copy that I'm working on right now, guess what? That part is now gone. <laughs> right. You know? we've, we've had discussions. Um, so Don's pretty innovative when he's running a, a program for a conference and he uh, utilizes Slack. And, and we have a lot of open, interesting conversations about um, abstracts, topics, and, uh, and we capture this. And, and we, we talked about what an abstract does. And and for me, it's it, it's the it's the trailer to a movie. It's the in a world where zombies have taken over. You know, this man rose and took care of the. You know, all that stuff that that they do in the trailer. That's what the abstract is to me. It's telling me. Um, it, it's giving a situation. It's telling. It's like the hero's journey, right? The hero is in a current situation, and then there's going to be a call to action. And then there's going to be this 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 journey with all of these different um, these aspects that we see in every adventure. And at the end, I'm going to come back to my my world different and changed. And now I want you to tell me how I'm going to be changed. And and, and that's how I, I view the abstract. And we've had great conversations around that. Uh, but I think what we're pulling apart. And Jason, you're being a great sport for letting us kind of expose some of the things from your abstract and talk through it and. And taking some of those those straight shots that that some of us like to throw, what we're doing is exposing that uh, just how that abstract can work, how it should work, and and exposing some of our thoughts on um, 
on the role that an abstract plays. You know, what do you guys think about you know the abstracts in general? Is it a, is it like trailer to a movie for you, or or do you see it as something being a little different? Yeah, I think that that's very fair. Really, the abstract is the advertisement. Um, if I look at that and I see you know anger and frustration, I'm done. I won't go. If I look and I see that it's something fun, and I'm I'm a little, you know, especially in the afternoon and mid-morning, I, I'm probably going to go. And then if I see that it's a topic that matters to me, yeah. So you just kind of, you're teasing me in with that. That's the top of the funnel. And probably I will make a decision by the time I get to the fourth sentence anyway. Right. Because I'm, I have a whole bunch of other ones to look at that yeah. are across the same period, especially at a big conference like this. Um, yeah, tease me in. Give me the little, the little trailer. Um, start off with... Do you like scotch? Who would you? Who, are you interested in scotch? But you just don't like that that medicinal, peaty flavor. Well, did you know that peat is not a, fla- f- a feature of all scotch whiskeys? You can enjoy Ooh. the low peat or no peat Speyside style scotches, which are sweet and pleasant, and still don't lack in complexity. Come and learn, guys. I, I think we're heading towards the end of our time box, and, and Jason, I think. Uh... Again, you've been a great sport. We've pulled together a few ideas that I think you're going to take back and, and workshop this abstract. Uh, wanted to go around kind of the, the fun, the last fun question. And I know this is something that comes up whenever we talk about our experiences curating conferences, no matter which one it is. And, and we'll start with, uh, let's start with Don. But what is the most annoying thing that, uh, that you see in submissions, Don, that just immediately makes you send it right to the bin? A uh, failure to follow the suggested help. There were so many sessions this year that people had just followed the suggestions that the program committee put together. We would have had a very, we may have, might have had a very, very different track. And then I think one of the things that you said also uh, comes into play. So there's things that become popular every year. You know, a couple years ago it was Daniel Pink's uh autonomy mastery and purpose this year it seems to be turning the ship around and uh purpose driven and after you've seen the fourth or fifth session that talks about this topic and invokes it as part of the session you go uh well yes and have you actually done this because the book's only a year old you probably haven't done this in real life it's 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 not a not a bad idea, but it's just once again that one of many. And if I have seven sessions that talk about purpose driven and or the turn the ship around, then you've niched yourself in with a bunch of other people, and now you're competing against other people, as opposed to finding a a unique space and a unique voice. Absolutely. Tim, what do you think? When you're thinking about abstracts, whether you're a conference attendee or even uh, curating or, or reviewing conference submissions, what's the immediate uh, send to the bin type of thing that, uh, that, that, that triggers you? Strangely enough, anger, if it's written like, you guys don't know what you're doing, I know. You know any kind of anger or arrogance, any, any trigger words in there that's like, I don't, there's none in this one, by the way. But sometimes you'll see, it'll be um, anger or arrogance. I'll come and teach you jokers to how it really works, you moron. I just don't go to those. I don't enjoy them. I never have any fun and I never learn anything. So keep the love alive, man. Amitai, what do you think? I guess I filter things out when I can't see any trace of personality. So I guess that's kind of like the, the scotch flavors. There's There's a single malt in every person and some of them have turned into a blend because they think they're supposed to turn into a blend. But I want to get that the flavor of a place of that particular person coming across in the abstract. So if it seems like it's just all business language or nothing about their own experience, or I can't get any clue about what kind of a person this is going to be giving the talk, then I, you know, I could just as well go to somebody else. Jason, how about you? Well, I, I agree with everything that's been said. So I'll say something else that I, I know we've I've seen in conferences, both the Agile conference and other conferences that I organize, um, and actually serve basically as a as a coordinator. Um, a vendor pitch. I mean, if there, if you're a vendor, I think that there's a channel that you should go through to be involved in the conference. And it's not typically being on the program. If there is a call for papers, you, if you want to do a vendor pitch, you should exhibit at the conference and, you know, 
go down in the expo hall and do all the vendor pitching you want, but leave the program open for those that want to, you know, promote more open ideas and allow thought leadership to be curated. Yeah, I, I think that's a great one. And, and for me, it's I, I hate the secret sauce. And so what I mean by that is when you submit an abstract or you submit a proposal that has um, information for the program team like Agile 2016 does, and it says, I'm going to teach you something amazing, but I'm not going to tell the reviewers what it is because I'm going to save it for the conference or for the talk. It's in the bin. The, the reviewers need to know what the secret sauce is. We are curious just like anyone else. And if it's not apparent, at least for me, if it's not apparent what you're trying to do, I can never give it a thumbs up. And that, and that for me is one of my, my biggest, biggest frustrations, along with Tim's anger. So when I see, you know, we've talked about Don, on the podcast before, uh, you know, Don, Jason, and Amitai, you guys are all, uh, and Tim, you guys are all at the top of your fields in programming and, and agile thinking. I've moved into the management side of things. And so when I see a talk that says, managers are idiots and we're going to make them better, it goes to the bin. Because I, I, I think there's more to it than just that. And I think you guys are the same where these, de- these developers, if only they would do this, the world would be so much better. I think those go to the bin too. So I think Tim points out a very important one that it, it's almost like uh, what we wish campaigning would be. We wish it would be positive. We want to hear a positive message in your abstract. We want to hear one, a, a positive message that, that reinforces uh, the human spirit and what's great about what people and, and interactions and collaboration can do. Uh, we don't want to hear about uh, the latest axe to grind. And I think that's a, an important point as well. So at this point of the, of the podcast, guys, we've hit our time box. Uh, this is our, our opportunity for you guys to tell us about anything that you have going on, anything that you'd like to plug, anything that you think the listener should know about uh, so that uh, we can get that in front of them and and help promote anything that you have going on. We're going to start with Amitai. Amitai, what are you up to? So my email address is schmanz at schmanz.com. My Twitter handle is schmanz. My website is www.schmanz.com. I think there's a theme here somewhere. S-C-H-M-O-N-Z. Uh, also, I have a little podcast you may have heard of called Agile in Three Minutes. You can check that one out as well. Uh, so by the time you hear this, uh, I probably will have had a really good time at the Agile Alliance Technical Conference, which is a new thing going on in North Carolina uh, a week from now as we record, but probably already happened as you listen. Uh, you probably also missed your chance to go to Agile Indy by now, so too bad, but I'm sure it will have been great. Uh, so what I can mention that's coming up, I will be speaking at Agile and Beyond in Michigan. Uh, Agile and Beyond, May 5th and 6th. Uh, I will also be attending Kalamazoo X, which is a super cool one-day conference where people who are used to hearing technical content come and hear life-altering inspirational stories from technical people. It's a really cool conference, kalamazoox.org. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm not speaking this year, but I am excited to attend Self Conference, which is May 20th and 21st in Detroit. And uh, this one is also, it's, it's half technical and half people and humans. And so it's up to you to decide which of those you think are the hard skills, which you think are the soft ones. I have an opinion about that, but it's a super cool conference and I'm excited to be going this year. Don, I'm sure you're, if you're not globe trotting, you're, you're up to something. So what, uh, what have you got going on, sir? So Esther and I just returned uh, within a month uh, at the end of, well, at the start of March, start of this month, we came back from doing two workshops of coaching beyond the team in South Africa. Had a wonderful time with the Agilists down there. Yes, I am off to Chennai, India this Friday, next Friday night. So uh, coming back from that will be the next Coaching Beyond the Team in Malmo, Sweden. Coachingbeyondtheteam.com for more information. And it looks like our next scheduled Coaching Beyond the Team will be in the United States in September, uh, just in front of the Agile Open Southern California. So that would be like the 13th and 14th of September will be the coaching beyond the team in the US. You know, our friends out in SoCal are trying to get me out there and Don, if you're gonna be there, I might have to just pop on out. So uh we're talking with Victor and it looks favorable. Calendars are clear and space seems to be available. So and and that gives us a chance to go out to attend Agile Open. 
Very good. Mr. Tice, so I will do some of your plugging for you since sometimes that can be awkward, but Jason is uh, one of the co-hosts of This Agile Life. This is an excellent podcast. So uh, John Sextro is the other co-host. I listen to it. I, I really enjoy it. Jason and John, uh, Craig, Craig Buschek, uh, between the three of them, they bring quite a bit uh, to the table. Lots of really good Agile discussions. It is one of my favorites, along with Amitai's Agile in Three Minutes. These are the ones that, that we all listen to. Uh, it's really great stuff. But So, Jason, I stole this Agile life, but what else do you have going well, on? Well, I learned I would be spending a lot of time with Amitai. That's kind of cool because uh, we're, we're going to do a cool thing, and so you'll be hearing about it after this at the um, the Agile Alliance Technical Conference where we're going to – we have an area called Play Over Study – or, sorry, or Fun Over Study where we've got a whole rundown of a variety of activities that we're going to run – to kind of demonstrate different ways to learn about technical practices. So uh, we're going to run a bunch of stuff there. We'll, you'll hear about that. Got uh, Agile and Beyond, too, with Amitai also. Um, I had the privilege this year, again, to help with the program for the Agile Games co- Conference in Boston, which is in late April. Uh, come up and join us there. We're still um, we still have tickets for that. That'll come out. Um, actually, before that, uh, just mention it since we got a few Midwesterners here. I'm actually holding an Agile Open Space in St. Louis, Missouri, on April 22nd. So that's an open event. It's actually a low cost event. So it's like 40 bucks. Come hang out for a day. We'll have a lot of fun. And the one that um, I'll just mention, throw it out there. I got a few other things on the calendar, but I did want to get the word out about it. And of course, Ryan knows about this because he was pestering me about this. Is working <laughs> with Paul Booz and others. I, I volunteered to do Coach Camp also in St. Louis, Missouri this year. It will be in the fall in October, the weekend of October 14th, 15th, and 16th. So it's kind of like the Friday, Saturday, Sunday combination. We'll start with like a games day on Friday, and then on and then on Saturday and Sunday we'll do the Coach Camp format. All of that will be done as open space. So guess what? Just show up and share or show up and learn. And um, we're not ready to sell tickets for that. We're still finalizing, but uh, – uh, we'll make sure the website to follow and learn more and follow us on Twitter. Uh, we'll get that to Ryan to put in the show notes. So this is my most favorite conference. So this is the one that uh, I look forward to the most each year. I'm really appreciative that Jason took the reins on uh, Agile Coach Camp US for this year. Paul Boost did a great job last year in Washington, D.C. Uh, we had a great time at the out, out there. Just a great experience. Now Jason taking on that monumental task. It's not simple putting it together. So really appreciate Jason doing that. Uh, looking forward to the trip to St. Louis. I'm sure many of us will be heading out there. So that's wonderful to hear. Well, come hang out. We're having fun. Oh yeah. Tim, what have you got going on, sir? Oh my goodness. So many things. So um, of course, always check um, at Agile Otter. And at Industrial Logic, we've uh, taken some of the things that we've been teaching about uh, safety and thinking as programmers and, and software developers. And some of those uh, are appearing now on the, on the Industrial Logic blog and, and drawing some comments. And I think there's a lot of good that's going to come of this as a part of the whole modern Agile arc. Um, beyond that, let's see, in May, um, I'm in Agile and Beyond. In April, I'm in Agile Indy. So we'll see our friends there. Um, I'm at um, Big Apple Scrum Day in May. I'm at Agile 2016 this year. Um, I'll also be at Agile Iowa in August and lean into Agile in October. And it looks like um, I'm waiting for finals on this, but in June, I will be at the Chicago Coder Conference. All right. Great stuff. So we're going to, we're probably going to recruit you a little bit for the podcast out at uh, Agile Indy, Tim. So I hope you're ready. Well, that'd be great. Oh, also there's, there's this rumor going around that there's going to be an Agile in the Flash uh, podcast series starting soon. So uh, stay tuned to this channel. Yes. Tim's uh, excellent book from a, a number of years back. I can't wait. And I, uh, you know, Tim, uh, really feel fortunate that Tim's involved uh, myself in that, working with him and Jeff a little bit on uh, getting that put together. I think this is going to be exciting for people, Tim, to to come back to have discussions around all of those. Oh, Amitai's got his copy right there. It's uh, I think it's an important book for many Agilists out there, and I, I think this one's going to be huge. So I love the fact that you and Jeff are coming back together to talk about uh, all of these cards that have influenced so many of us. Oh, it's, so, it's very exciting to us. Let me tell you, we're both a little on, on, it, on the edge of our seats, kind of eager about getting it going. Yep. 
it, it's all great stuff. And for me, guys, I will be at Path to Agility in Columbus, Ohio. I think that's May 25th and 26th, or it's maybe 24th and 25th. Uh, Agile 2016, uh, as we mentioned, uh, I'll be out speaking out there as well. Might have a few more added to the schedule, so I will be around and, and at some of the, the conferences if you want to uh, stop by, say hello. I love meeting listeners and and uh, all of you out there uh, have had some really great interactions as I've traveled around the country giving talks and, and attending conferences. So that's been excellent. On a personal note, uh, my wife and I are expecting child number three in April. So there may be a, a gap of a week or two for the podcast. I hope that all of you will understand that a new child will bring new challenges. And so there may be a week or two without the podcast, but we're going to try to prevent that, get a few ready and, and get them in the can. But uh, if not, that's what I'm up to. So I will be not sleeping and taking care of an infant. Uh, so that will, uh, but that's all great stuff as well. A future agilist to add to our ranks, I, I certainly hope so. That will be fun. Other than that, I uh, just want to promote all the great things that these guys are doing. Um, you know, Tim with, with the new book stuff, Amitai with this technical conference out in uh, North Carolina. That's a wonderful uh, accomplishment to be a, among a, a huge group of, of just giants in our industry. So Amitai, that's, that's excellent. Tice uh, taking on Agile Coach Camp US. It's a, it's a great service to the whole community. That's, I think that's the favorite conference of, of most of us out there because it's just a chance to, to catch up and, and, and kind of work our craft with uh, many of our peers. And Don, I mean, what's not awesome about you, Don? I mean, it's, it's just great that you join us and, and, and hang out with us. So always good stuff. I love all the friends that uh, that participate and uh, just really grateful for these opportunities. So, And I feel that way about the listeners as well. So I'm grateful that you're here. I'm glad that uh, I get so many notes and that all of us get so many notes. I'm a tie. We see a number of tweets. Tim, I think you get some of those as well, just about how much people enjoy the podcast and, and what the value that it brings. And so I can't thank you enough for those notes and just for being here. If it weren't for you, we wouldn't do this. So thank you for listening. And I hope all of you have a great night. Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com.